Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadow lark. So God made a farmer. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and as usual, I'm just super happy you're joining me today. And uh, today, on this episode, I want to discuss seven perennials you might want to consider growing on your homestead. I want to go over how to prepare the uh, the, the, the beds, uh, how to maintain them, and how to really make the best use of these perennials on a few of these. Um, before we jump into all that, how about a few homesteading updates? Um, around here, the trees are blooming. The seedlings are up. Um just enjoying it. You know, this is no doubt uh, the busiest and my favorite time of the year. I, well, I just start getting excited, guys. I mean, it, I was starting to wonder if I was going to get super excited this year. I mean, things have been kind of like blah, and I've been having those winter blues and thinking, man, I just don't want to get out there and do anything. And then green things started popping up and trees started blooming and I was like getting all excited. And, and, uh, I got out there, especially this weekend and, and last weekend, did a lot of work around the homestead and just, Oh, I love this time of the year. I just love it. Um, I'm uh, trying all kinds of new things this year. I want to do, uh, you know, I had mentioned in the Facebook page, uh, in our Facebook group, uh, that is the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, uh, which if you're not a part of, you really should be. Uh, you need to be a part of that community. Join over 20,000 other homesteaders uh, and those aspiring to be homesteaders as we ask and answer questions, share successes and failures, and generally just make some friends and build some community. Uh, just search uh, Facebook for Homestead Front Porch and um, ask to join. It's a closed group, but all you have to do to join is ask. But I digress. Uh, back to that. Um, I had talked in there a little bit about to somebody. They asked a question about blocking um, or keeping grass from growing into their garden. And I had recently heard about, uh, well, not so recent. It's been a while back, but <clears throat> I thought about it, uh, planting comfrey along a border to create a rhizome barrier to uh, stop uh, grass or whatnot from creeping up onto a into a path or Whatnot. And, you know, I had talked about it before, but it's not something I, I was doing. Well, I actually went out there and I have this uh, mulch pathway. It kind of goes, it's a little bit of a, just a garden feature, really. I have a little backyard pond and I have a bridge that you walk off my deck across that little bridge over the pond because I have a little river that runs into the pond. You walk over the bridge and then I have like this mulch trail with the large rocks on each side of it that kind of meanders and weaves through my garden back to a shed I have in the back of my property. And it's not a real long trail. It's just maybe 50, 60 feet, but it kind of meanders around. Well, grass will actually creeps around through them rocks and gets up into the path and actually is, is starting to like pop up into the mulch and stuff. And, um, I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to practice what I, what I was saying. I'm going to do a little test run here. So I went and dropped, uh, comfrey, uh, root cuttings. I had a bunch of it. I chopped, dug up and just broke a bunch of pieces off and I dropped them just every maybe six, five, six inches all made the little, just a little trench and just dropped them all along the edge of those rocks on that, on that border. And I'm going to try to create a rhizome barrier using comfrey. Cause if you've ever noticed, uh, if you, if you grow comfrey, you've seen this, it, it gets this, this massive root and it goes really deep and really thick and really solid. I mean, I, nothing can really get past it because it's like a solid wall of root and uh, planting them just every few inches like that. And they're all kind of, I figured they're all going to kind of grow together. I mean, this is the theory and, and what I've seen other people talk about. And it just creates this, this root and rhizome barrier, um, that won't spread like some rhizomes. It stays right there because this is a Russian variety of comfrey. Um, it, it really doesn't, it expands a little, but not much. It maybe get a few inches in diameter. The root barrier will, um, but not. It doesn't just keep going like something like bamboo or, or Jerusalem artichoke, which we're going to talk about today, by the way, um, does and won't spread out. But but it'll create this wall underground, which will keep the uh, the grass and and other invasive. Uh, um, weeds like I'm thinking crabgrass. We have a little bit of crabgrass here, and it'll keep it from walking up into that pathway. Uh, so I'm doing. I, I kind of 
all the way around that path, I probably put down 60 or 70 uh, root cuttings all on that path. And I probably spaced them a little further apart than maybe I should. I probably went, I probably went eight to 10 inches. Actually, I probably should have put more, but that's what I had. I wanted to make sure I had enough. So I just kind of spaced them out a little bit. So I might have some, still some openings of where grass can get in, but as it grows bigger and bigger, it'll actually shade that out. Um, the leaves will hang over even and of the uh, comfrey and shade out the, the grass probably keep it from growing somewhat, but that's a nice little experiment I wanted to try. And I'm going to be reporting back on that probably by the end of summer. Uh, it takes a while for comfrey to get really big. I mean, it'll grow this year, uh, and it'll make, it'll create a small plant, no doubt about it, but really it has to have about it. I find that the second year is when comfrey really gets huge and, 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 you know, really goes into its own where you can start breaking off even more root uh, cuttings from it and stuff. And so by next year, I'll really have a good idea of how that's working out. So, um, I actually thought I'd try comfrey on that side and I actually thought about trying, uh, and this is the south side. So this is the sun, the side's getting sun. So it tends to walk for some reason. It grows better on that side of the path than it does on the other side. It, I notice more weeds creeping in from that side, from the south side into the into the path to the north. So I thought that's where I'd put the the comfrey. And I actually thought I have a bunch of uh, hostas uh, growing around the front, and I thought about separating a bunch of those and planting hostas on the other side as an experiment and seeing if hostas will even create any kind of a rhizome barrier that will keep it from coming in from the other side. I don't think it'll be quite as effective as comfrey, but I actually think that it would work too. Cause I've actually dug up my hostas before and separated them and they actually create a pretty thick mat of, 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 uh, roots as well. Not like comfrey, but you know, you have to kind of pull it apart and it creates a little bit of a barrier as well. So I thought about even trying that with, uh, with hostas on the other side, um, uh, all the way along that. So might be doing some experimenting there. Um, so we had a lot going on there. Had the, uh, the last week I went to that homestead meetup at a friend's house and met a few people. And I took some, I took some comfrey plants to pass out there. And uh, I took some bacon wrapped rabbit that we cooked on the smoker. So we hickory smoked, uh, the rabbit with some bacon wrapped around it. And I took a bunch of kombucha and some pint jars and passed that out too. So that was kind of a big hit. People who'd never tried kombucha or had only tried store bought kombucha and didn't like it seemed to like the, uh, the homemade stuff. So that was fun. I, and, and you know, we didn't, it was more of just literally a hangout. Uh, with some other homesteaders or some people who are thinking about getting into homestead and just having some chats than it was actually going and doing anything official, but it was a good time. And it, you know, and I met some people and had a good time. And, and, and you know what I found was interesting is, is this guy is actually, he's kind of big into bushcrafting and hiking and things like that. And the people that came were people from that genre. I mean, these were people from, you know, that was their hobby. They were people who were, were hikers, backpackers, um, bushcrafters who are really getting into homesteading. They're, they're actually bringing some of the skills onto their properties and really starting to build homesteads. And, uh, so it was kind of fun to talk to them. So of course, you know, there was a lot of, uh, bushcraft type talk going, talk going on, but, but definitely these people are really, really interested. I'm, I'm like, I like seeing those barriers crossed and people bringing some of those skills and bringing them back and creating a homestead with them. So I, I, we've talked about some things that I found interesting. You know, they're talking about starting fires from, you know, doing, um, friction fires and things like that. And, and uh, that was pretty fun. You know, it was a fun time. Uh, so hopefully we'll be doing more. I know we're going to be doing more of those, uh, this year. I know that friend of mine, he's wanting to have another one or two, maybe even this year out there. So, uh, looking forward to that. We're going to have some upper seventies, uh, temps this week. So I'm hoping to get out and find some, uh, some morel mushrooms. Uh, it's that time of the year. And, uh, I didn't get out and find any last year. So hopefully, uh, maybe I can find some time later this week because we're going to have some like 77, close to 80. It's, we've had a lot of moisture. We've had a lot of rain in the last uh, couple weeks. So with those kind of temperatures, I'm thinking the mushrooms are going to be popping up around here. So uh, I can't wait to get out and uh, look for some mushrooms. So that's what's going on around here on my little old corner of the world, my little homestead. Um, just lots of spring type activities, you know, planting stuff, uh, getting ready to plant some more stuff even. And, um, you know, just having a lot of fun doing homesteading stuff. Uh, went out there yesterday and did a major, major cleaning on the rab rabbitry. And, uh, that was a lot of work. <laughs> I was kind of tired, but, uh, needed to be done. It, it was the first big cleaning since winter time. And I pretty much just kind of do the half to stuff all through the winter. And then you got that really major spring cleaning when you're, I brought out several wheelbarrow fulls of, uh, 
of good old rabbit manure and uh, got that in a compost pile working right now. So that'll be some great, uh, great garden uh, stuff later. So I can't wait to get that on a garden and start doing some good with that. I mean, you can put, that's one of the great things about rabbit manure as it can go. It's a cold manure. It can go straight on the garden, but I, I have a lot of stuff already on the gardens uh, that I put there back in the fall and even a little bit in the spring uh, earlier. So this is just a bunch of stuff that it's just going to compost and it's going to be a really, really good compost. I mixed it in with the whole big, I had this, uh, I built a little, uh, I, I'll call it a compost bin, but it's really just a holding area for some bunch of leaves. Um, and I filled this thing and packed this, this is a four by four square. I just took four pallets, uh, plastic pallets and put them together. And I had it packed full of leaves all winter long. And, uh, just cause I didn't need them. I didn't need them for any compost. So I'm mixing the rabbit manure in with it and I'm just going to let it cook, um, till next year, basically. And then I'll have some really, really good, rich compost from there, uh, next year, just mixed with leaves. So that'll be some good stuff. So that's, that's what's going on here at the small town homestead. I hope in your, uh, homestead you're uh, making progress and uh, springtime is uh getting you excited and you're uh, getting out there and doing lots of lots of stuff doing the things you know uh but anyway let's jump right into our main topic of discussion today today i want to talk about growing uh seven perennials that you should probably consider growing on your homestead uh what is a perennial exactly it's a plant that that lives more than two years uh, an annual lives one, then they have biannuals, uh, that go two. they'll go to seed in their second year, but then you have perennials, which live more than two years. So they, you know, it's something you plant and every year it comes back and then you just keep reaping the rewards of that. Uh, they can live and produce for several years. Some of them can outlive you. <laughs> I mean, it just depends on what it is. I mean, honestly, uh, every berry bush, is a is a perennial all your trees are perennials okay those are perennials um, but i want to talk about plants uh, so i mean we have fruit trees and berry bushes and those are those are obvious but we're going to talk about some of the plants that i think uh you know you should consider growing a couple of these i'm not growing so but i i, I say you should consider them because i'm considering them and i'm probably going to start growing a couple of these the pros of growing perennials well it can be low maintenance especially after you get them started. Sometimes there's a little bit of maintenance involved in getting them started, but once you actually get them established, um, they're low maintenance usually. Uh, an ongoing harvest is obviously a pro of uh, of perennials. Um, just reap the rewards year after year. And also, perennials can improve soil. Uh, a lot of them bring up the nutrients out of soil. They have deep tap roots. Um, uh, and they do a lot of uh, dropping of, of their fodder onto the ground. Uh, it's a good compost material for the, for what's under them, you know, for the ground under them. So, uh, they do a lot to improve soil. They don't really take from the soil like annuals do. They, they give back a lot to the soil. So, um, it, it does definitely improve soil. Some cons of perennials though, uh, some are very slow to get established. And we'll talk about a couple of those today. Um, some can be invasive and we'll definitely talk about a couple of those today as well, too. Uh, they all require a permanent location where you put them is where they're going to be. And there's also a possibility of pest and disease issues because you can't, you can't do crop rotation. They're going to come back in the same year, same place year after year. So there can be a problem with pest and disease, uh, affecting them. So again, like I said, fruit trees, berry bushes are obvious, but these are seven perennial plants that many people don't think of when it comes to gardening. Well, a couple of them are real, are something everybody, most of you listening very well probably are growing a couple of these. And especially this first one I'm going to talk about. The first one I want to talk about today is strawberries. It's, it's a very obvious one. It's, it's probably, it's one I hesitated even mentioning just because I feel like a lot of people are probably already growing it. And it's probably something you're already considering if you're not growing them. But it's just the most common of the perennials, and it's probably one of the easiest to grow. And I think if you're not growing it, you definitely need to consider growing it. And you're going to you're gonna really appreciate the fact that you did start growing it the first time you bite into one of your strawberries that you grew on your homestead. Because <laughs> there's just not much better from the garden than a juicy, sweet strawberry, uh, especially when you didn't have to plant it that year. I mean, it came back from last year, okay? Um, there are... Uh, let's talk about some varieties of strawberries. Here's three that you need to know the difference in June bearing strawberries. Uh, these are, these will give you like a monster crop of, of berries every year. June is generally the time of the year that they bear the fruit 
Um, it can be a little earlier. It, it can be later, depending on your zone. But they're called June bearing strawberries. And you'll get one big crop from them, and then they're done. Uh, they'll come back next year and do the same thing. There's also ever bearing strawberry plants and and these have a more modest size crop you won't get as many in bulk from them but they'll kind of put out throughout the whole season uh, as long as there is 12 hours of daylight they'll continue to bear until the end of summer so they'll they'll just go out there and you'll pick a few berries uh, all the time and there's also called uh, one called day neutral strawberry these have three peak periods of fruiting um, usually these these will fruit in early june in mid-July and in late August. So it kind of spreads out more of a bulk uh, crop. They're just day neutral. Um, I I have a mixture of June bearing and ever bearing in my strawberry patch. I don't know that you should do that, but it doesn't seem to cause any harm. I'll get a big, you know, a big old crop of them around June, but then I have the others will put off throughout the rest of the year as well. So they're kind of just a mixture there. I kind of planted them together. And I've never heard anybody say do that, or don't do that. Uh, someone might know of a reason you shouldn't do that, but it seems to be working out pretty well for me. And I've been growing them for four years in this spot, and 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 they do pretty good. But some things you need to know about uh, starting a strawberry patch is you want to pick the spot. You want to pick a spot with plenty of sunlight. Uh, you want to avoid frost pockets uh, because you know they're it's, it, they're going to start if you if you get something that's um, it's going to frost late. Uh, it could damage your crop and they may not put off. So you want to you know, find a place that it's not you know, a frost pocket where you see a frost gathering late in the season. Um, and you want a, a place with good drainage. Um, you want to prepare the soil. You want it to be weed free. You want it to be loose uh, soil. And when you first, uh, before you plant there first, you want to mix some compost in. I like to loosen up the soil a few inches deep and just work some some finished compost in with my hands, just kind of get it really worked in good. And, um, that way you got a good, uh, soil for a heavy feeder, like, like strawberries. Um, well, let's talk about planting strawberries. If you're going to start with bare root strawberries, they should be planted about 12 to 18 inches apart. The crown of the strawberry, this is where I messed up one time. I actually bought some, um, some strawberry crowns, uh, roots, and I buried them deep. <laughs> I, I did. I mean, I put them three, four inches, under the ground and they never came up uh you want the crown which I, again i did this back five years ago i just get in the garden i just dug holes and dropped the roots down in thought, oh they'll pop up but that's actually a crown and the crown should be level with the soil surface the very top of that you'll see how your roots kind of spread out from the bottom you put that crown just level at the soil surface you don't bury it it should be level um, if you're starting with plants though um this, the, the spacing still applies 12 to 18, 18 inches apart and you know what? It's the easiest way to go. Um, they're expensive, though. They can be. I actually found a guy locally who was uh, selling them, and uh, I bought a ton of them from him when I started. I had a few that I bought from, like, Walmart, and I started a few that way, and I never had a big crop because, you know, they were just um, – I didn't buy a bunch of them because they were so expensive. Well, then I found this guy selling them on Craigslist, actually, of all places. And I went over and bought several uh, trays of them from him. And I built a bigger patch because we love strawberries around here. Uh, but you don't really need a lot if you got time because a few will actually turn into a lot. They'll send out runners and they'll quickly fill in the spaces between the plants. That's why you want them, you know, 12 to 18 inches apart. And they'll, I, I did that in my patch and it's solid plants now. I mean, you can't, there's not, you can't see the ground at all. It's completely ground covered. So, uh, you can plant them that far apart. And in a couple seasons, you'll have a really thick patch. Um, but you'll need to maintain that patch. The first year, uh, you need to pick, you need, and this is hard. You need to pinch off the blossoms. You're not going to get any strawberries for sure. Yeah. I let a few go, you know, and I got a few strawberries the first year. You're not supposed to though. You're supposed to pinch off the blossoms to help the plants establish. And then you also want to thin the crop as they die off. Uh, actually, they're they're a perennial, but they really are a perennial because they're sending out runners and they're producing other plants beside them. But those plants will die. So you want to cut off the dead stems and you want to uh, pick out the dead leaves and you want to thin out the patch every year because you'll see dead ones and you'll have to, you want to thin that out so they'll get more airflow and and and, and just it'll it'll just make your um, your patch a lot healthier. Also, you want to fertilize the patch. I put down about one to two inches of compost in the fall around the plants every year. Just take some compost and finish compost. Just kind of work it in around the plants and uh, let that set all winter and they'll be healthy. And you'll get, you'll feed your uh, strawberries for the next year doing that. That's about all you have to do. They're pretty low maintenance, uh, perennial. 
all in all. Like I said, there's a few little things you want to do hands on, but I don't have a lot of pest problems. Now, once the, if you leave the strawberries there too long, it'll, it'll definitely, bugs will eat them. I mean, it's a, it's a nice, tasty, I mean, if you like them, they like them too. They're going to want to eat them. So you want to be diligent, get out there. And if you find ripe ones, start picking them, you know, don't leave them on the, don't leave them on the plant too long, get them picked out. Uh, but I don't have a lot of pest pressure with mine. It seems like, um, I don't do a lot of maintenance. I go in there once or twice a year and pick out some dead leaves and dead stems. And I put the compost on, uh, in the fall. That's all I do. And I have strawberries every year. So it's a great perennial to grow if you're not already growing them. Um, another great, uh, perennial to grow is rhubarb. Um, this is a vegetable that is generally used as a fruit <laughs> in desserts and jams, um, of the rhubarb plant, now this is really, really important, only the stalks are eaten. Don't eat the leaves. Don't ever, ever eat the leaves. They're toxic. Uh, they will make you sick. They could kill you if you ate too much of it. Don't eat the leaves. You only eat the stems. Um, they're poisonous. Be sure that they're not ingested. But rhubarb stalks are awesome. They're great. Um, it's easy to grow. They do better in cooler weather. And I'm going to be honest with you. Everything I read about rhubarb says pick them and put them in full sunlight. And I find that mine actually do better in a partial shade. Uh, I think they, when you got them out in the full sun, they, they don't seem to do as well. Once they get established, maybe. But, man, when you're starting them out, I think they do better in partial sunlight. Maybe they don't grow as fast, but they definitely don't wither up either. Um I mean, that's just me because everything I read says they want full sunlight. Um, but again, when you're picking the spot, you need a place that's well drained, place that's fertile. Um, like I said, partial to full sunlight. And, you know, it needs to be a space that can accommodate very large plants because these things get huge. Um, so that, that patch is going to get big. When you start a rhubarb patch, it's going to get big. So you need a big spot for them um, to prepare the soil. Uh, rhubarb plants are really heavy feeders, so you need a lot of organic matter. So be sure to, uh, mix in a lot of compost, a lot of rotted manure, anything high in organic matter in the soil. And, and, and here's a little tip that I learned later. Uh, didn't, I don't use chemical fertilizers anyway, but don't add a chemical fertilizer first year on rhubarb plants. Um, because direct contact with nitrates can actually kill your rhubarb plants. So, uh, especially the first year of growth, don't add anything, just natural stuff, chem, uh, compost. And, uh, I mean, I wouldn't put like manure tea on them, even though it's a natural thing because it's high in nitrates, uh, it can kill your rhubarb plants. So just, uh, uh, just fertilize or you just, um, compost and, uh, rotted manure are really good to use, uh, when you're first establishing the bed and just make sure it's good loose soil, get them planted. They're going to establish um, when you're planting rhubarb, uh, I like to start with the one-year rhubarb crowns or a plant. But you plant the crowns in early spring, as soon as the ground is workable, uh, as soon as uh, you know it's not frozen anymore, um, when the roots are still dormant, and uh, before the growth begins on the crown. Um, or if you're planting uh, plants just beginning, when your plants are just beginning to leaf out, uh, rhubarb can also be planted in the fall after they go dormant. But uh, you'll want to space your rhubarb plants about four feet apart. That's how big these things are going to get. They, they get huge. And uh, plant the roots about one to two inches below the surface of the soil if you're starting with uh, the crowns. Bring the crown, if you're planting roots, one or two inches below the soil. Bring that crown pretty close to the top of the soil, and, and they'll do well. Um, I, I would probably buy a couple plants. These things are so big that two or three plants will probably give you plenty of rhubarb. And it'll expand and grow and spread out. As, as it grows, as it establishes, you don't have to worry about weeds real bad once rhubarb is established because it's, it's so big and it has such huge leaves that it really smothers out, uh, weeds around it for the most part. You'll have to be a little bit diligent in the beginning, maybe making sure that, you know, keep weeds away from it when you first start it. But once it establishes, you're probably not going to have a weed issue because they're going to shade out anything below those leaves. Um, but you'll want to keep it free of competition at first. Um, because rhubarb is a heavy feeder, though, you'll want to add probably about three inches of finished compost every fall. And I also like to add uh, mulch with comfrey leaves 
and uh, and, and feed with a compost tea after it's established after the first year. So I'll put a lot of comfrey leaves because I have so much comfrey around here. I put comfrey leaves around everything because it's such a good mulch and heavy and uh, and really uh, good for the soil. It has a lot of uh, nutrients in it. Uh, rhubarb loves that so i'll mulch a lot of uh, comfrey dead comfrey leaves around my uh, rhubarb plants really help it um so you'll want to put a lot of stuff down for it to, to eat on because it is a heavy feeder and it'll do better if it has a lot of uh, nutrients to feed off of so there's there's rhubarb i think it's one that a lot of people will probably start when they have a homestead it was one of the first perennials i planted on my homestead because you know what i remember eating it when i was a kid and i loved it i mean it's just i i Actually, another kid had showed it. I've never ate it before, and um, I was hanging out with this other kid on the playground, and, and this was kind of dangerous because I didn't know anything about it. But I was just, you know, I'm a dumb kid, and I just take my friend's word for it. And he's like, "Hey, that's rhubarb. We got some of that at our house." And we're sitting there on the playground, the back part of the school yard, eating rhubarb out of a off of a fence line. <laughs> but I remember how much I enjoyed it, and I thought, "Man, I want I want to grow rhubarb because uh, I remember it from when I was a kid, and uh, I love the stuff. It's great." Now, I've always ate rhubarb pies and things like that, so it's just a really good thing to grow. Another uh, number three uh, uh, perennial that I think you should consider growing is asparagus. Now, asparagus can be a lot of of work in the beginning, but uh, young asparagus shoots they're delicious, and and they're one of the first crops of a spring harvest. So it's something early in the year that you're going to get to eat, which is always great. Um, and this perennial is just packed with with nutrients. It's got a ton of health benefits. Uh, so you definitely considering growing asparagus is wise, but to start an asparagus bed, like I said, it's a little bit of work. You want to pick a good spot. Uh, you know, asparagus is probably going to be there for like 20 years. So you definitely want to find a permanent place, um, with light soil, loomy soil, full sun, um, so that it'll warm up quickly in the spring. Cause like I said, it's going to be some one of them early spring harvests. So you want to place it's full sun for sure with these, a uh, place it drains well. They do not like standing water at all. So you don't want to place any place them anywhere where they're going to have standing water of any kind because it will quickly uh, rot the roots. So it's got to have good drainage to prepare the soil. Uh, you loosen the soil, remove all the perennial weeds and roots and, uh, dig in plenty of, of aged manure and finished compost. If you have a clay based soil, mixing in some sand, uh, can help prepare a bed for asparagus. They actually like a sandy soil, uh, really good draining. So that, that helps. And then to, to plant the asparagus, I'm going to tell you probably avoid seeds. You can, if, if you want the challenge, you can try growing it from seed. It's going to take a lot longer. I would suggest getting some one year old crowns. It's going to give you a little bit of a head start and, uh, plant the asparagus crowns. You're going to dig trenches about 12 inches wide and six inches deep in this, in this bed that you've prepared. Uh, place the crowns in the trench about one and a half to two feet apart. And then top them with two to three inches of soil. Now, remember, you dug a trench that's six inches deep, but you're just putting about three inches of soil back over them. And then about two weeks later, you're going to add another inch or two of soil back over it. You're just going to push it back over. And then you're going to continue adding the soil over them periodically until the soil is slightly mounted above the surface level of the other soil around it. And this will allow for some settling of the soil. This will be over a few week period of time. Um, and that's how you get it started. And once you get it started though, it's going to do really well. I mean, uh, it takes, it takes some time to get it really going, but once you get some plants growing, once you get some shoots popping up that first year, you're good. You're golden. Now you can apply some mulch after that to smother weeds. As soon as they start popping up, I'd, I'd put some, maybe some mulch down around it. Just kind of smother any weeds out, kind of cut back the competition. Uh, cause those young spears are going to, are going to want all the nutrients they can get. Um, and if you don't do that, it could reduce your yields, but you want to be careful about removing the weeds that do up here because it'd be really easy to uproot your, your crown. So be careful about that. You want to water them really regularly, uh, during the first two years after planting for two years, you're going to baby this bed. Now, you, this is why I say this is one of the harder things to get established, but once you get them established, oh man, you, th this is great, but you want to water them really good for the first two years after planting them. You want to fertilize them heavy. Uh, in the spring and the fall with some compost tea. And if you've never seen asparagus grow, it's kind of a big bushy fern type plant. And you're going to want to leave that, that foliage in the wintertime and just kind of let it lay down on the bed. You might want to cover some straw or whatnot to kind of help protect that uh, ground and the roots a little bit, uh, keep them from, from real heavy uh, freezing for some winter protection there. And then here's the thing. You're not going to harvest any asparagus spears for the first two years. 
that these plants are in the permanent bed. You just don't want to touch them. You're just going to let them grow. You're going to let them grow their full plant. You're going to let them lay down. And then you're going to trim them back in in the spring. Cut, get rid of the foliage, clean up your bed, you know, cut them at the ground and just let it do its thing again. And for two years, you're going to do that. They need to put all their energy into establishing some deep roots. During the third season, you can pick spears over a four week period of time. And then the fourth year, you can extend your harvest to eight weeks and then you're going to have plenty of spears popping up. But you got, like I said, for, for three years, you, this this bed's going to be it's not going to give you everything it can give you. That's why this is this one takes some time to establish. But then once you establish it, you're going to have 20 years of of production out of this bed, good production out of this bed. If you do it right, get it set up solid, let it expand, it's going to be do it's going to do really really good for you and you're going to have a lot of asparagus spears to eat. So, it's a great one. It's one that takes some time. It's not for the impatient gardener, that's for sure. And sometimes I can be a little impatient, but once you got it established, it's very, very good uh, perennial to have on your on your homestead. Uh, the number, f- the fourth one I want to talk about today is is one that a lot of uh, you hear a lot of talk about it in the prepping community um, because it's just a it's just this really great uh, perennial that's like die hard and if you want food for life, it's kind of like one of those plants and that's Jerusalem artichoke. Um, the Jerusalem artichoke is a perennial sunflower native to North America. It produces tubers that can either be eaten raw or cooked. They're tasty. They're available all winter. They're exceptionally easy to grow. And um, they're they're completely undemanding. And they're very low maintenance. They do have one drawback. The, <laughs> the uh, tubers, depending on how you prepare them, will cause some gas. <laughs> they're a gassy food, okay? Just putting that out there, uh, just so you know. But very nutritious. Uh, they're a great uh, uh, potato substitute. That's how anything you, you're going to use a, a dish for potatoes, you can use Jerusalem artichoke for. Like I said, it's got that one drawback. Uh, so you want to be um, delicate on how much you eat, I guess. it's To me, it's like the, uh, the White Castle version of garden foods. It will tear you up if you eat too much of it. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Some people say, well, what's a White Castle? Because maybe you don't have White Castles. There are these little tiny burgers. Uh, that you get it's a it's a fast food place and if you eat i don't know i i don't eat them i i might eat them once every couple of years just to remember why i shouldn't eat them but uh they'll tear you up um that's what kind of like what jerusalem artichoke does <laughs> to be honest uh when you're um planting or starting to grow jerusalem artichokes it's very important that you pick the right spot for these this is extremely there's probably no there's probably no perennial more important to pay attention to this on than Jerusalem artichoke. It's extremely important that you pick the right place. Um, is it's going to be there for a long time and it can be invasive. You need to also give this plant plenty of room to grow and may even have a way to contain them because they send out rhizomes that, that, and they'll spread and spread and spread and hard to stop. You need some kind of a barrier, perhaps, to stop them or have them in a place where it doesn't matter how much they spread. Have a lot of room for them. Let them just go crazy. Also, they get tall, um, which it, it can be a benefit. You can provide a living screen or a windbreak. Um, These things can get up to like 10 feet tall. So it can be a huge, huge plant. But I'll tell you a little trick about that here in a few minutes. Um, so they can shade out other plants. So you want to you know, plant them in a place where that won't happen. So, again, um, pick the right place for them. Preparing the soil. Uh, these these are not picky plants. They will grow just about anywhere other than soggy soil. They won't grow where rice will grow, okay? Um, but or or anything like that. So they they need dry soil. Um, but you know they do best in loose soil with a pH of about six point five. But like I said, these are not picky plants. That's why people love them because they will grow just about anywhere. Plant the tubers four to six inches deep when you get them. 12 to 18 inches apart. And uh, if they're already sprouting, make sure that the shoots are pointing upward. It's about all you need to know about these. And stick them in the ground, walk away, and they will go crazy. (laughs) Okay. Um, To maintain them, again, these plants are going to grow about 10 foot tall. So they are prone to getting blown over. Um, So in the midsummer, if you want, what you can do is cut them down to about four or five feet. And this is actually going to cause them to bush out a little bit more, put out more flowers, 
And it also will encourage larger tuber growth when you do this. It'll put its energy into the roots instead of those tall stalks. So I like to do that. I cut them back to about four or five feet, and they'll still grow a little bit beyond that, um, maybe six feet. Uh, and it'll get really bushy and really pretty. I mean, they're a nice looking plant. When you let them grow straight up and get really tall, they actually don't look near as nice anyway. If you cut them a little shorter, they'll get bushy and actually look really nice, but they'll put more energy into those, into those tubers, uh, doing that. So you can start har- harvesting the tubers after the first frost. That's when it's best to start harvesting them. Um, uh, when the plant starts to die back. And if you're in a, some, if you're somewhere warmer, then just leave the harvest until midwinter. Uh, that's when they're going to be best. Um, Jerusalem artichokes don't store real well. So, but here's the thing. One of their big advantages is that they're happy just being left in the ground or through the winter until you need them. If your ground tends to freeze, you can mulch real heavy with a lot of straw or just other mulch material, um, over the top of that bed. And then you can just kind of pull it back and dig the soil when, um, when you want tubers and they'll be there and they'll preserve really well in the ground. It's not necessary to dig them all up. If you've created a, a permanent bed for them, they'll just keep coming back. Uh, but they can get kind of congested if you don't dig them up. It's actually better practice to dig them out, up as many as you can find and then replant them in the spring. But I don't do that. Actually, I'm not even growing any right now where I actually had my patch. Um, I actually built the rabbit tree over the top of it. <laughs> so uh, it was my best place for them. And I haven't really established another place for them yet that I think they would do really well because I'm limited on space and artichoke. These need some, these need some, some space to grow. So I'm actually, I may not grow them anymore, but I had a nice little patch of them back where the rabbit tree is. And I picked them one year and then I built the rabbit tree there in the spring. And of course they need sun. So they're not growing. Uh, they're in the ground underneath the rabbit tree. Um, so, you know, I'm not growing any right now, but they're great. Uh, they're really great if you got a place for them. And uh, right now I'm just debating on whether or not they're worth having a place for them. Um, but if you've got some room, they're a great perennial to grow. Highly recommend them. And at very low, probably the lowest maintenance of and easiest to grow of all the perennials I'm talking about today, for sure. Um, the other one I want to talk about, uh, number five, is French sorrel. Um, there are different types of sorrel. There's the garden sorrel. There's like a, what's called a red blood sorrel. I think it's called. And these are all good. There's actually some that aren't very palatable by, by humans, but, but, uh, animal livestock lives them. So, uh, like them. So they're good for fodder, but French sorrel is really good for culinary purposes. It's the one I like. It's tangy. It's lemony, lemony flavored. The, the young leaves, they're kind of acidic. Um, uh, but you can use the, uh, the mature leaves. They don't, they're not quite as good tasting raw, but you can steam them or saute them like, uh, like spinach. So really good, really good culinary, uh, herb. It's an herb technically, but it, you know, the leaves get anywhere from six inches to 12 inches long. So it's kind of a big, big, a little bit bigger of a plant. Um, it's real important to pick a spot for, for sorrel, a permanent place, full to partial sun, well-drained soil. They like well-drained soil. You'll want to loosen the soil at least six inches deep. And mix in a good finished compost before you start the seeds. They like a pH. They need a pH between 5.5 and 6.8. They'll, they'll do really well in that. Plant, when you're planting sorrel, you can plant them from seed. Direct sow them. Uh, plant the seeds about eight inches apart. Uh, you can actually plant the seeds a few weeks before the last frost date. Uh, sorrel is super cold hardy. And it won't hurt the seedlings when it starts popping up if they get a frost. It can be started indoors and transplanted as well. That's fine. But it's just an easy thing to start. So uh, planting from seeds is not a problem. Sorrel needs plenty of water um, throughout the growing season. You'll want to keep weeds out of the sorrel beds. They're not a tall plant. Like I said, 8 to 12 inches tall. I mean, it's a pretty good size leaf, but it's not super tall. So it can get taken over by taller weeds around it. And shade it out if, if you let weeds kind of take over. So you want to keep it weeded. Also, sorrel's prone to aphid attacks. Aphids love it. So you'll have to be diligent, uh, diligent against, uh, getting rid of those. But uh, fortunately, that's the easiest of pests to control. So a little soapy water will take care of them. Um, sorrel will bolt and create a seed head in hot weather. So it will spread by seed. So, um, and it, when it bolts and, and puts off its seed head, Uh, it'll actually stop producing leaves. So what you'll want to do as soon as it bolts is to cut that seed head off uh, to keep it producing leaves. It's just like everything, spinach, lettuce, all that stuff. When it starts bolting, it just ain't near as good and it stops producing good well. So, you know, get rid of the seed head on those because you don't, you're not going to need it. It's a perennial. It don't need to put off seeds. 
Uh, to harvest sorrel, you just pick off the outer leaves and the plant will continue to grow new leaves all season long. So it's a perennial. It keeps giving all season. It's cold hardy. So it'll go early to late in the season. Uh, it'll give you food. So it's just a really good one to have around and it's simple to grow and it doesn't take up a lot of space, but it, it's just, uh, it's a nice little uh, perennial vegetable to grow. Um, number six, lovage. Lovage is a great perennial. It's a very hardy. And here's the thing. I, I'm horrible about growing celery. I don't know what it is about celery. I have the hardest time growing celery. Now I've grown it from a celery stock. Like you'll take and when you buy celery and you'll cut the bottom of it off and you'll plant that and then it'll regrow. I've done that. That works. But when I grow celery from seed, I don't know what it is. I have the hardest time growing celery. <laughs> I really do. Um, parsley though, you know, uh, is, is fairly easy to grow, but this lovage is a very good celery and parsley substitute in dishes. Um, all parts of this herb are usable. The leaves can be used in salads. The root can actually be dug up at the end of the season and used as a vegetable. But the stems can replace the, sa- the celery uh, in dishes. Uh, and the flower, uh, flower yields, uh, they have like an aromatic oil. So they're, they are used in culinary purposes as well. The lovage seeds and stems are often used as flavoring in candy making, which I think is pretty interesting. I've never done that, but I could see where it would be used for that. Uh, the seeds are a common ingredient in flavored oils and vinegars. So uh, they put off a lot of um, oil and, and flavor. So you steep it in, in, in the liquid. And they, it just kind of releases its flavor over time. So it's got a lot of purposes. There's a lot you can do with lovage. That's why I think it's one of the a, one of the better ones to grow. Um, and like I said, I'm looking for anything that will replace celery because I've got a green thumb like nobody's business, but I have the hardest time with celery. I don't know if my set my my soil just isn't good for it or what. But it's me and celery, we don't get along. It's probably it's probably the thing I have the hardest time growing. It really is. So lovage, I don't need celery. Thank you, lovage. Um, to start growing lovage, you need to pick a good spot. It's a large plant, a very large plant. It gets up to six feet tall, maybe a little taller. It's really bushy. Uh, so you need a spot that's going to accommodate a plant that size. And lovage needs well-drained soil and lots of sun, lots of sun. <laughs> okay, it needs to be full sun for sure. These plants like a sandy, loamy soil with a pH around 6.5. They're They're a heavy feeder when they get started, but once they establish that you don't really have to do a lot. So you'll want to, when you first prepare the bed, you'll want to mix in some finished compost, but they do send down a really deep tap root, uh, after they establish. So it is easier. You don't have to worry about as much. So they'll pull up the nutrients on their own, um, once they're established. So, but the first season, when you're first preparing the bed, mix in some compost, get them started, give them that good, healthy uh, boost. You can, uh, you can direct sow lovage seeds, indoors five to six weeks before the date of the last frost or you can just wait till it's time after the last frost date and direct sow them outside you'll just kind of uh kind of like lettuce you'll just put the seeds down and just kind of sprinkle them on the soil and just kind of dust the soil over the top of them they don't need to be deep at all just kind of like a dusting over the top of them like i said they can be sown outside once the temperatures have warmed up to about 60 degrees so that that's what i do did when i first started mine um just put them directly outside but you can start them early inside you'll want to keep the seedlings uh the soil moist until they're a few inches tall and you'll want to plant these things about 18 inches apart because like i said they're going to get big they're going to get bushy and big and it's going to be a thick mat of uh of, of growth so you'll probably just want to do like one row you know, you can walk down either side of it is if you start trying to make like multiple rows, they'll grow kind of so thick. You won't even get, be able to get between them. So just like a one row thing somewhere, um, that we can walk along it and kind of pick it, uh, to maintain lovage. Like I said, it's going to, it's going to develop a long tap root. It's not going to require a lot of maintenance because it's a large bushy plant. Weed pressure really won't bother it. So that's not going to be a problem. The plant can either grow back from the crowns or seeds that can be harvested for reseeding. You can also divide the crowns after a couple seasons to expand your crop. That's the easiest way to do it. So once established, it's a hardy perennial, uh, just grows back from its crowns. That's the best way to do it, I think. And then kind of like comfrey, you can pull the crowns up and you kind of separate it and then, and then replant the crowns, um, like that. It seems to work really well. Uh, so that's the way you can kind of expand your crop. Pretty easy. It's a really easy, really good tasting, lots of uses, a fantastic plant to grow number seven the last one i'm going to mention today 
is watercress. Watercress is something I'm not growing right now, but I have a place I can grow it, and I'm going to start growing it. Watercress is a perennial cultivated for its clean and slightly peppery tasting leaves and stems. I do like the taste of it. I have, have, have had it before, but I'm not growing it, but I'm going to start growing it. Um, watercress thrives in clear, slow moving water. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a little, like a little Creek that I've put in that kind of grows under a bridge and into a small pond I have in my backyard. So I have an ideal place for growing some watercress, um, picking the spot. If, if you have any sort of water feature on your land, on your homestead, it's the, it's a great place to do it. You can grow it in, um, in pots. Uh, uh, you can make a little water feature, screw it in. It can be grown that way. Buckets. There's people who grow it in like five gallon buckets with some soil and, and really just keep it really almost standing in water. Um, there's tricks to that. Uh, but slow moving water is probably the, the best way to do it. Uh, it likes consistently wet soil. With a pH of 6.5 to 7.5, and it likes to be in full sun. To plant watercress, it can be grown from seed, transplants, or cuttings. Uh, the seeds are, are tiny, so they need to be uh, lightly like broadcast over, kind of like lettuce seeds, broadcast over a prepared site, and then just kind of just rubbed in. You don't even have to like bury them or anything. Just kind of rub them in like you would, uh, uh, or water them in even. If it's, if it's damp soil, which it should be where you're planting them, they'll probably just stick right there, and you won't have to do anything to them. So three weeks before your last frost date uh, for your area, and the uh, the plant will germinate best in cool conditions, 50 to 60 degrees, but not frigid. And see, I'm reading all this off of some, so I've never grown it, but I'm just, this is what I'm, I'm reading about it, because I don't know, I've never grown it, but I'm going to start growing it because I'm excited about having it. Uh, keep the planting area moist, but not covered with water. So I'm thinking along the edge of my little creek, right there where the, the soil gets in the soil right there. That's ideal for it. Uh, it. It sounds like it's a really easy perennial to get started. It's going to come back every year once you establish it. And it's great tasting. And it is something a lot of people just forage because it's pretty readily available as a foraged uh, of vegetable. But, man, how great is it? I mean, yeah, I can go forage raspberries and blackberries, too. But I love having them in my backyard, you know. I love just walking out there and grabbing stuff. So if I can walk out there and grab some watercress... Sounds great. Um, the number one concern with, with watercress, obviously, is consistent moisture. It's it's what it needs. Uh, from what I read, it doesn't have a high nutrient requirement, so you're not going to have to feed it, but it, you should keep it free from weeds because it could probably smother it out. It's a really low, creepy, crawly plant, so it's you know it could get smothered out, I guess, before it gets established really well. So you want to keep the weeds away from it and uh, just make sure it's damp all the time as that's what it requires so there you have it folks a uh, couple that i'm not growing that i'm excited to get started growing but seven perennials that i think you should consider growing i think they would be really good additions to your homestead and i'm even excited to add a couple of those to my homestead because i think they'd be great so um i do want to recommend a couple books today i want to recommend now i mentioned this one on last week's podcast but that's gaia's garden by toby hemingway uh, it has stuff in there about perennials um, it's a permaculture book. It's a guide to home scale permaculture. This book is just covers a lot of stuff. So I, I recommended it a lot. I've recommended it several times on the podcast, but another one, I actually recommended this author last week, but I didn't recommend this book. I recommended a different book, but Eric Tonsmeyer has a book called perennial vegetables. Highly recommend that book. So get those two books. If you're wanting to know more about planting perennial vegetables, uh, so hope that that helped you out a lot. Hey, I want to jump into our new segment this week. I've done this for the last couple of weeks and I'm really enjoying it. It's called the homestead life. It's this new segment where I share something that's better in my life because of homesteading. And this week I want to talk about the thing that's better in my life is my change in perspective. Before homesteading, I thought differently about some things. I thought differently about insects. I thought differently about weeds. I, I thought differently about all the things that most people see as bad. And my main objective was to kill insects, to, to kill weeds, to kill <laughs> anything like that um, without any thought to my personal health, how it affected my neighbors or the planet. And now when I see a spider in my garden, I think about how his predatory instinct is to kill the other insects that are, are bad for my garden and use him as a natural pest control in my garden. Um, when I see a dandelion growing in my yard, I think about food and health and dynamic accumulator of nutrients rather than weed. Get rid of it. Um, homesteading has changed my worldview on a whole bunch of things for the better. 
And uh, that's something that I feel like the homesteading life is just really made things better in my life. Um, I love having that perspective about about nature, about weeds, about bugs, about other items. I love the change in my worldview. I love the change in my perspective. And it's making my world better. I think it, that eventually it makes for a better today and for a better tomorrow because I'm not doing all the things that were causing harm for the future um, on my homestead. So the homestead life will do a lot for you. Uh, it'll it'll make you see things a lot different and uh, it'll change your perspective. So enjoy that. This podcast is made possible uh, first by those who join our Homestead Forum membership community. If you want to learn more about that, go to thehomesteadforum.com. Uh, there's also a link in the show notes. This is episode 82, so smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 82 to get the show notes for this episode. But head on over to the homesteadforum.com. That's the thehomesteadforum.com, and you can learn more all about uh, what we're doing there. Uh, that That is doing a lot to support this podcast and the other projects of Small Town Homestead, like our Front Porch Facebook group and, and all the other things we're doing. And, um, you know, you're getting a lot if you go and uh, I'll just let you go over there and check it out. And you're going to see all the benefits you get from join, joining that membership community. Uh, plus, you're really going to get to do a lot to to help this uh, this podcast be here long term. And uh, we also appreciate those who encourage us by leaving an iTunes review or sharing this podcast with our friends and family. I really appreciate that. This, we grow in number every week, uh, the, the people who listen to this podcast. And I really appreciate those of you who are spreading the word about this podcast. It goes a long way. I, I can't even tell you, I can't even express to you how much it means to me when I get emails from you folks or I see an, I, uh, or I read an iTunes review about how much you enjoy the show and what it's doing for you it means a lot to me. And it encourages me and inspires me to jump behind this mic and keep going long term. So appreciate that. Uh, you guys make it possible for this podcast to be here. Because if I thought no one was listening and I thought no one cared and I thought no one wanted to step up to support it by joining our Homestead Forum membership community, it would go away. Because I would be like, well, why, why should I put my time into it if nobody wants it there? So, you know, you doing those things. Uh, we'll ensure that it stays here uh, for sure. So thank you so much for supporting it. Thank you so much for listening. And until the next episode, happy homesteading and God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.